Welcome back to the channel guys. Today we've got the latest budget-friendly Acer Nitro gaming laptops. Intel versus AMD. Can you really game on laptops this cheap? We are super excited to share with you our days and days of benchmark tests between the two. We did multiple different tests with different RAM configurations, external monitors, and quality settings. We ran seven different tests on these machines across 11 different games for a total of 154 gaming benchmarks and a bunch of other benchmarks that you're for sure gonna wanna stick around for. It's a collection of about 30 hours of benchmark tests that's gonna actually help you on on other gaming laptops as well. Now we've already created a fun unboxing of this laptop, but in this video, we're gonna break down everything that you're gonna need to know before deciding if this budget laptop is actually even worth $750. Aside from gaming benchmarks, we're also gonna be talking about the fan noise, design and build quality, the internals, thermals, battery, and software. And we're gonna be giving our personal recommendation between the two near the end. We've got an Intel i5-11400H and an AMD Ryzen 5-5600H, both with NVIDIA GT GTX 1650 GPUs with four gigabytes of video RAM and a 256 SSD drive. I ran my games mostly from an external hard drive, so the tiny SSD drive didn't really bother me too much. But if you don't have one, you're gonna run out of space quick. Design and build quality. The Nitro 5 was built with gamers in mind. On the lid, you're greeted with an inset glossy Acer logo, surrounded by chisel designs angling downward from the chamfered corners towards the smaller accent red Nitro logo at the back. I do I do like the overall sci-fi design of the laptop, but I'm not a huge fan of the almost sports car-like design on the back. Just not quite something I'd feel comfortable with bringing to a meeting. Upon opening the lid, you're met with a pretty decent sized touchpad. Its precision was on point and the clicks had just the right amount of feedback and sensitivity but it wasn't quite as smooth as what I'm used to with my Alienware M17. Just felt a little rough and almost sticky. Most everything is made of a less than premium feeling plastic, although the plastic on the interior has a different feel to it, which kind of mimics a colder and harder metal material. However, the center of it does have a considerable amount of keyboard flex. There is also a pretty considerable amount of screen flex as well, the most that I've ever seen on a gaming laptop actually. It also had the most amount of screen wobble that I've seen. The inside side is covered with a buffet of unnecessary stickers. At this point, it's almost comical to be bragging about an HDMI port in 2021. It's almost like a smartphone bragging about its ability to make phone calls. Introducing the new iPhone 13 with voice communication technology, but we like to call it voice time. Now the keyboard isn't full RGB and it doesn't include any animations, but it does have an appealing red glow that's actually pretty bright. Like a lot brighter than my Alienware M17 backlighting. And believe it or not, I actually like the feel of the keyboard on the Acer Nitro more than the keyboard on my Alienware M17. It has a more firm and confident press and better travel distance, as well as being pretty comfortable and quiet to type on. This is what it sounds like. Okay, so moving on to the ports. On the left side, we've got a Kensington lock port, exhaust ventilation, an RJ45 Ethernet port, two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, and a headphone and microphone jack. On the right side, we've got more exhaust ventilation, an HDMI port, a USB 3.2 Gen 2 port with power off charging, and a Thunderbolt 4 port, or just a regular USB-C on the AMD model. And on the back side, we've got mostly ventilation with just one lonely little power port. And then on the bottom, we have some pretty minimal air intake ventilation. Okay, so moving on, to the internals. So you can see we've got two heat pipes, a heat sink, and two fans, and two RAM slots. This one came with eight gigabytes of DDR4 X16 RAM, our 256 gigabyte SSD drive, and a removable Wi-Fi card. And then at the bottom, we've got a slot for another hard drive. And then next to that, a very small 48 watt hour battery. And then two tiny little speakers there at the bottom. So how well did this tiny battery perform? For HD streaming at 50% brightness and battery saver mode, we got two hours on the Intel version and two hours hours 15 minutes on the AMD version. For web surfing, we got three hours and 11 minutes on the Intel and three hours 30 minutes on the AMD version. And it took about two hours to recharge both machines back to 100%. One of the reasons the Ryzen model lasted a little bit longer than the Intel version was due to the screen being slightly dimmer on that one, which brings us into the display quality. Here you can see side by side what our color range is tested at on each monitor. Really not all that impressive. The colors look just okay, but honestly, I didn't expect too much from a gaming laptop 
laptop that's this inexpensive. Both machines were pretty similar color-wise, but as far as brightness goes, there was a considerable difference. Only 230 nits on the 144 megahertz AMD model, but 285 nits on the Intel 60 hertz screen. As far as thermals go, this machine really didn't get that hot, but that's also partly due to the fact that it doesn't really push that much power either. Here are the average CPU temperatures we got with each test across all of the different games. You can see that the AMD version is a few degrees cooler than the Intel version. And here are the average GPU temperatures. Again, a few degrees cooler on the AMD version, but honestly, neither of these computers really got that hot. Also not very hot on the outside, the touchpad, or the keys. See below for my link in the description for our Google spreadsheet showing all of these different games with each of their graphs individually, as well as how they compare to all my other gaming laptop reviews. Fan noise. In quiet mode, the fans measured around 43 decibels. And when gaming with Cooler Boost turned on, they were a little bit louder at about 48 decibels. And if you force it to that insane max fan mode, we got a little bit over 59 decibels. Which is honestly pretty loud, but also completely unnecessary because the Cooler Boost mode did a pretty good job intelligently deciding how fast the fans actually needed to be. Which even when maxed out, didn't need to be that fast. Or loud. So now, everybody's favorite part, performance and gaming benchmarks. Here's our Geekbench 5 scores across all of our different RAM configurations. You can see that the most expensive RAM on the Intel machine performed the highest, but it wasn't that big of a jump with the single core score. However, it was a massive 15% jump with the multi-core score. For Cinebench R23, the better RAM test showed very minimal improvement, with the Intel version outperforming the AMD version by about 7-13%, to and we got similar results with the multi-core tests. For 3 d Mark, our overall score showed very minimal improvement from the RAM upgrades as well, and so did the 3D Mark graphics scores. However, the 3D Mark CPU score showed a massive improvement from RAM modifications. So, gaming benchmarks. We did a lot of testing for you guys here, and we're going to go through these pretty quick, so feel free to hit the pause button or check out the link in the description to view all these games at your own pace. For Call of Duty Black Ops 4, we got a 20% increase in performance for up to 86 frames per second. And by the way, all of these better RAM tests were also done at highest preset settings. Forza Horizon 4 saw a 22% boost up to 73 frames per second. And with all of these gaming benchmarks, you can expect a 7-10% to increase on top of these numbers by also using an external monitor. Now for Doom Eternal, we didn't have enough VRAM to allow for ultra settings, so we compared everything to its high preset. Here we saw a 23% increase up to 80 frames per second. Apex Legends, a 32% FPS increase up to 86 frames per second. Now the FPS with Cyberpunk 2077 was disappointing even at the lowest presets. A 16% improvement maxing out at only 29 frames per second. We got a 5% increase with Witcher 3 up to 42 frames per second, and a massive 50% improvement with Warzone up to 60 frames per second. 50% with Fortnite up to 78 frames per second, 32% with GTA 5 up to 110 frames per second, and a 15% boost with Minecraft up to 228 frames per second. Overall, a 25% increase across all games using that maxed out higher speed RAM. For all you creatives out there, I was utterly impressed with my ability to actually edit in 4K on both of these machines. With only 8 gigabytes of memory and 1080p scrubbed in the timeline like butter. But I wasn't able to scrub with 4K until creating proxies for my clips. Here are my export results with a 10 minute HD video. Almost twice as fast after the upgrades with exports taking almost half the time as before, and almost three times faster with the Intel machine when rendering 4K. After Effects saw about a 30% speed increase, and DaVinci Resolve saw a pretty good boost in performance as well. Now for Pugent benchmark tests, unfortunately the 1650 GPU did not have enough VRAM to allow for that. Sound quality. The sound was not good. It was actually the worst that I've heard on any gaming laptop so far. The bass just sounds extra hollow and weak, and as far as loudness, it only reached 80 decibels at maximum volume, which is just about as loud as a window AC unit the webcams. The quality of the webcams on both machines was not that great, but each were pretty bad in their own way. I'm honestly pretty surprised that they weren't equal here. The AMD machine was a little blurry but didn't have as much grain, while the Intel version was sharper but had a lot of grain. I think I prefer the look on the Intel version just a little bit more though. And here's an outdoor sample of that audio and video quality. So as far as the software goes, the main app you'll be using is the Nitro Sense app, which can be accessed from the keyboard with this cool dedicated button right here. Not too many sets 
settings, unfortunately. When you have this cool boost enabled, it'll intelligently increase the fan speeds based on how hot your GPU and CPU is getting. And then underneath that, your power plan settings where you can modify your plugged in and battery modes. And then you've got some pretty basic CPU and GPU monitoring. And then up here, a bunch of different audio presets. And then an optional setting for turning off that glowing keyboard. And then we've got this DTS Sound Unbound app, which balances your audio settings with your power to save on battery. And then an Acer Care Center, which allows you to check up on your battery health, memory, and internet status. You can do some tune-up, a spot for driver updates, and then support and recovery management. So my overall pros and cons. My overall top reasons you should not get this computer. Number one is it's not very fast. Number two is the loud fans. And number three is that horrendous sound quality, which isn't that big of a deal if you use headphones or speakers. But for people that just like to use their laptop speakers, you're going to be pretty disappointed. My overall top reasons you should get this computer. Number one is that glorious HDMI port. Kidding. My top reason to get this computer is the great value. The performance to money ratio is pretty high with this one. Honestly, most YouTube videos are only 30 frames per second, not 60 frames per second. So there's a lot of you that really won't appreciate anything above 60 frames per second anyways. Which honestly, for a lot of games, these machines were able to handle that even at the highest preset settings. And number two is it's also pretty good for creatives. I could not believe I could actually edit in 4K on a $750 laptop. And then number three, that surprisingly unexpectedly comfortable keyboard. Between these two machines, I prefer the Intel version just a little bit more, with faster renders when using the better RAM, and a screen that was noticeably brighter, even though it was only 60 hertz versus the 144 hertz on the AMD version. On a budget gaming laptop, most games won't even be able to take advantage of that 144 hertz. So aside from several small nitpicking dislikes, this is a pretty good laptop for the money, and I do recommend it for anybody that's on a budget right now. It just it gets the job done. And sometimes that's all you need. Guys, remember every Friday I do a giveaway that randomly selects someone who's interacted with this channel. So make sure to like, comment, and subscribe with notifications turned on to keep an eye out for that each week, as well as staying up to date with all of the latest and greatest gaming laptops. Before I announce today's winner, if you're gonna be getting this laptop, please remember to use my affiliate links in the description below as I get a small commission at no cost to you for every single purchase made. And the winner for this week is... Rightful obstacle. Thanks for watching, guys. I love you guys. God bless.